If dictator Ferdinand Marcos's photo is put side by side with the ABS-CBN logo, what will immediately come to mind is this. ABS-CBN was seized from the Lopez family. Benedictus people took over the ABS-CBN studios in Bahal Avenue, Quezon City. And Eugenio Lopez Jr., then president of ABS-CBN, was imprisoned. But what the public didn't know is that before they became enemies, they were first partners. Daniel Lopez's brother, Fernando, inside the political arena, the Lopez's were able to exponentially increase their fortunes. For them, all it took was a series of patient courtship, sweet words, and red roses to be in the highest leader's favor. In other words, rent-seeking. But sweet words and red roses don't always get through the heart. The Lopezes found themselves fighting against multiple attacks to their family and their prized businesses during the term of former President Justado Macapagal, whose rival's campaign, Carlos Garcias, was funded by the Lopezes. Desperate to get out of the abusive relationship, the Lopez brothers set out to find a new partner to help them rise to glory. They say love finds you in the right time, just when you need it. True enough, Marcos saw the light at the end of the tunnel, the other end of his red string. He grabbed the opportunity and begged for the chance to be with Lopez in the upcoming election. Despite knowing that he would be a rebound, he still courted the brothers like he absolutely knew that Fernando was his perfect mate. Well, the greatest things do not come easy. Just like Romeo and Juliet, Marcos had a tough time pleasing Fernando's Ali. But with Imelda's beauty and innocence, the warnings of Eugenia's legal advisors against running with Marcos vanished into thin air. Marcos got Lopez's sweet yes, and they became running mates under the Nationalista Party. Partners. I wanna be an endgame. I wanna be a first string. If there's a perfect word to describe what kind of lover the Lopez's are, it's that they are generous. To prove so, they spent 14 million pesos or in today's money value is equivalent to 1.3 billion to launch campaigns for Marcus's election. This includes a campaign jingle, a poster, and the use of the brothers' paper Manila Chronicle as well as their airwaves in radio and television. The experienced Lopezes knew the influence their media company holds and therefore gives it to Marcos. Quoting it from their jingle, Tayo na kay Marcos Lopez, tayo na sa nasyonalista. They were, indeed, in the fight together. I would be complex, I would be cool. They'd say their honeymoon lasted for years. Marcos was re-elected in the 1969 presidential elections with the help of the Lopezes, and the Lopezes were able to expand and diversify Meralco and grow Meralco Securities Corporation's assets from 155 million pesos to over a billion before the declaration of martial law. It is said that the Lopezes were able to secure rate increase approvals from the Public Service Commission that allowed them to increase profits. But honeymoons don't always last forever, and theirs was already fleeting. I knew you were trouble when you walked in. News broke out in January of 1971 that the Marcos Lopez alliance was broken after Fernando's resignation from the cabinet. Marcos said that the Lopezes were demanding concessions for their own business interest, while the Lopezes claimed that Marcos wants shares in their family corporations. They were falling out of love and they were falling hard. The Lopezes used the Manila Chronicle to expose corruption in Marcos' administration while Marcos vowed to crush the Lopezes to pieces. Yeah, he's a reason for the tear drops on my 
lovers know how to hurt each other best, for they know each other better than anyone. It was five months of media exposure against the president. Unbothered by Marcus's remarks against their oligarchy, the Lopezes continued with their lavish lifestyle and even had the party of the century within the same year. It has been a tragic love story for the star-crossed lovers until someone broke the ice. Marcos seemed to pick up what's left of them to plead for peace. He called Eugenio and fled to the Chronicle building to reconcile with his partner Fernando. But did things really go back to the way they were? Did they really get over the rough patch? What's coming next? Oh, look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. Push finally came to shove. After Marcos declared martial law, he went after the Lopez's properties. Among them was their precious broadcast center placed under the control of Marcos cronies Roberto and Kichi Benedicto. Marcos also went after their family, jailing Eugenio's son Jenny for allegedly conspiring to assassinate the president. In 1975, a cancer struck Eugenio Lopez asked Marcos for a last visit from his son. But Marcos refused and even denied his other children to visit him. Eugenio died on July 6 of the same year. Their bad blood bled the Lopez's dry and it took a revolution for them to come back. We are never, ever, ever getting back. Everyone knows how the Lopez's suffered during martial law, but this narrative of patient courtship, sweet words, and red roses was conveniently left out in their history. We get it. Bad relationships are hard stories to tell, but when it's between a dictator with blood on his hands and a rent-seeking conglomerate with a past of political favors, it's a story that concerns the people too. The world deserves to know how the Lopezes and the Marcuses turned from partners to exes.